Okay. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce our morning keynote for today. And um, this is uh, a man who has been described as a prince among men, George Neald, Dr. George Neald. Um, we all know him because he led the charge at AST at the Office of Commercial Space Transportation for many years, but I'm here to tell you that he had a life not only before AST, he has a life after. So he is the president of Commercial Space Technologies, LLC, and this was an, established to encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space activities. So he's carrying on his mission. It, it's a mission that he, he, uh, he led us all with passion and grace, and he continues to do so. And I will tell you, he also, it's storied career. He's, he's been involved with aerospace for over 30 years from involvement with the Air Force. He was at NASA. He's been in private industry. And he has the benefit uh, and the wisdom that comes from wearing all those different hats and understanding all the different perspectives of, of the stakeholders that we all in this room represent. So I, I give you the podium. Thank you. for that introduction, and Mariba, Embry-Riddle, and UT Austin for putting on this very special event. You know, yesterday there were a number of very impressive, high-level technical presentations, and I thought that was excellent. But I thought I might just shake it up a little bit this morning to start off and do something a little bit different. I'm going to start my remarks with a story. This story has been around for a number of years. It's been told around the world in different variations based on the culture and the traditions of the countries involved. And the name of the story is Stone Soup. I chose this particular version because I really like the illustrations. But with your permission, I'm going to just sort of paraphrase some of the story in the interest of time rather than read every word verbatim. So, ready to go? Once upon a time, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was a village. It was a nice little village. Nothing very special or fancy, but the people who lived there were able to live comfortably and were in pretty good spirits most of the time. One day, a couple of travelers came to town. And they had worn coats and tattered hats and holes in their shoes. And they had been traveling for a long time. So they were tired and hungry. And when they saw the village, they thought, let's stop here. Maybe we can get something to eat. So they went up to one of the houses knocked on the door, and a woman opened the door, looked them up and down, and said, what do you want? And they said, excuse me, ma'am, I'm, so, I'm sorry to bother you, but we're very hungry. Do you care? Will you share? Do you have any food? The woman squinted her eyes and abruptly said, no, and slammed the door. So they went to the next house, and the next house, and the one after that. And everywhere they went, the answer was pretty much the same. We don't care. We won't share. There is no food. So about this time, the travelers were kind of discouraged. They sat down in the well at the, end of at the edge of town to rest a little bit, and one of them said, you know, if the people in this village really don't have any food, they're in worse shape than we are. Maybe we ought to make some of our magic soup for them. 
So they stood up on the side of the well and they shouted out, Hello, everyone! If anyone has a big pot, we'll make some of the best tasting soup you've ever had. And before long, a door opens and out comes a man with a great big black pot. And he says, I love food and I've got a big black pot. If you're master chefs like you say, let's see what you can do with it. So they said, watch and see. So they filled the pot with water, started a fire on the bottom. Pretty soon some steam was drifting up into the air. And a crowd of the villagers started gathering around. What's going on here? They asked. Well, we're making some very unusual soup. It requires a special magical ingredient that I'm pretty sure we can find in the village. And as everyone watched carefully, one of the strangers reached down, picked up an ordinary stone, tossed it into the pot with a splash, and said, we're making stone soup. It will be nutritious, it will be delicious, it will be incredible, it will be edible. But it would be even better if only we had a carrot. And the other traveler looked at him and said, where are we going to find a carrot in this town? Nobody has any food. We've already been to every house. And all they could say was, we don't care, we won't share, we don't have any food. Well, I guess we won't be able to make some soup today. So they started to turn away. But then a little girl raised her hand timidly and said, I may have a little carrot. Great! Bring what you've got. Throw it in the pot. We're making magic soup. But it would be even better if we had a potato. And a man in the back raised his hand, I have a potato! Wonderful! Bring what you've got. Throw it in the pot. We're making magic soup. But it would be even better if we had some additional ingredients. One person said, well, maybe I could bring a green bean. How about a kernel of corn? Some celery? A dash of pepper? A small turnip? What are you waiting for, said the travelers. Bring what you've got. Throw it in the pot, we're making magic soup. So everyone ran home and got a little something that they could bring, threw it in the pot. Before long, the pot was full, and a wonderful smell dripping through the air. <coughs> the smell was so tempting that the villagers started bringing out tables and chairs and bowls and spoons. They brought cheese and bread. Everyone came to taste the soup and marveled at the flavor. It's amazing, said one woman. These two travelers made such a delicious soup out of a stone. Out of a stone, said the traveler, and a special ingredient called sharing. So after the meal, the travelers were on their way. The villagers lived happily ever after. So what does that have to do with space traffic management? <laughs> well, I'll let you be the judge of that. But speaking of space traffic management, that's a subject that's been in the news a lot the last few years. We've seen a lot of interest paid by the press, a lot of attention. We've seen speeches and conferences interagency meetings, congressional hearings, a lot of talk. Not so much action so far. The White House, for its part, of course, has issued an executive order that reestablished the National Space Council under the leadership of the Vice President. We've seen four meetings of the Council have a user's advisories group stood up and four space policy directives issued. 
Space Policy Directive number three was specifically focused on space traffic management. And it talked about the fact that our, that our framework with best practices, technical guidelines, safety standards, norms, assessments, collision avoidance services, it's all essential to preserve the space operational environment. It goes on to say that the basic SSA data and STM services should continue to be provided without charge to users. It notes that the Secretary of Defense should maintain the authoritative catalog of space objects without really a definition of exactly what that means and what the implications are. But it recognizes that the DOD needs to focus on maintaining access to and freedom of action in space. So it should be a civil agency that is the focal point for providing collision avoidance support services and that the Department of Commerce should be that agency, unquote. So here's Secretary Ross, Department of Commerce. According to the White House, Commerce has got the ball. They are the STM focal point. But you notice I, I put a question mark on the title. Why is that? Because Congress has not yet provided the authority, the immunity, and the resources for them to do much at Commerce so far. So Congress has done some things related to space traffic management. Last summer, they passed the John S. McCain National Defense Authorization Act of 2019, and that has now been signed by the President. And that acknowledged that the DOD should not be the ones providing STM services, and so they've started a clock, and it's ticking. And less than five years from now, starting on January 1st, 2024, the Secretary of Defense will no longer be able to share SSA services and information or to obtain SSA data and information from non-U.S. government entities, unless that's required to support national security. So, that, I mean, that's a pretty high bar. So the clock is ticking. What's going to happen in that time? In addition to that, the House and Senate have each done some other things. There was a bill introduced in the House last June that had some pretty detailed and pretty ambitious things in it. It said in, no later than one year after the act is, is approved, the Secretary of Commerce should stand up a civil SSA program. It also said that the Secretary should provide for an SSA data test bed to facilitate innovation in SSA data. It said that the Secretary should spend at least $20 million per year for the next five years, and that not later than one year after enactment, the Secretary should publish Voluntary Civil Space Traffic Coordination Guidelines. So pretty ambitious. that's pretty fast for the government to do something that quickly. Now, unfortunately, that bill never even got to a vote, so it didn't go anywhere. The Senate, for its part, had something called the Space Frontier Act that was introduced back in July. It said that existing guidelines for the mitigation of horrible debris may not be adequate to ensure long-term usability. Well, surprise, surprise. I think everybody would agree with that. And that the U.S. should continue to exercise a leadership role in developing orbital debris prevention standards. Well, that's great motherhood words. This bill does not say who should do that, nor does it provide any resources for them to do that job. It also goes on to direct the Department of Commerce to stand up a Bureau of Space Commerce. That's something that would be headed by an assistant secretary 
that would report directly to the Secretary of Commerce. So presumably, that's Kevin O'Connell. But even though the Senate passed this bill, it went to the House and they did not take action. So this did not happen, and Kevin, our friend, is down in the bowels of NOAA now with a three-person office. So a lot of great talk, not yet any action. But it's not just the Congress that's thinking about STM these days. There's lots of folks all around the world. The International Academy of Astronautics has been particularly interested in this subject. And if you go back to 2006, they put out the Cosmic Study on Space Traffic Management. If you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to, to dig it out. It's an excellent resource in terms of describing what the problem is, who the players are, and what challenges we're facing in this area going forward. Just last year, the IAA published an update to that report. And that publication was titled, Towards a Roadmap for Implementation. And it had a lot of interesting things in it. It talked about the fact that there's a couple of different approaches that we could follow in trying to do something in the space traffic management area. You could have a top-down approach, which might involve international treaties or maybe even a, an outer space convention. You could have outer space traffic rules that are carefully developed and negotiated and eventually approved and then mandated by the international community on all of the, the space players. And outer space technical standards that, again, are negotiated and imposed on the users. Um, that, that sounds like something that would uh, be productive, but frankly, today in the international community, those things are going to be very hard to do, and it's going to take a long time if we get there at all. So there's another approach, and that would be more of an incremental approach, where you're going bottoms up. And there you might have things like bilateral agreements and public-private partnerships. You might talk about how we can do more sharing of SSA data and having national space legislation instead of trying to do something all at once on the international level. But whatever approach we take, I mean, the long-term objective is the same, and that is having a system that can enhance the safety of space operations and preserving the space environment, so space and sustainability. So what do you need to do that? Well, you're going to need hardware, you're going to need software, you're going to need some observations, you're going to need some people to make all of that happen. And I, I recognize that. those things aren't free. You can't expect that to just happen. So long term, we're going to have to think through, how does that work? Does that come from congressional appropriations? Is it a grant? Is it angel investors? Is it user fees? Is it contractors that pay for goods and services that they need? Putting all of that aside for now, I think it would be interesting for us to explore what could happen if we get all the interested parties together and see what we could bring to the table to have what I'm calling an STM stone soup, if you will. So what are the ingredients that you might want to have in such a concoction? Well. If you're a launch vehicle operator, maybe you could bring your planned launch dates and times and orbits, altitudes and inclinations, and when and where you're going to deploy things. If you're a satellite operator, you probably know where your satellite is, right? So you could bring that data. And if you have maneuver plans, either as part of your day-to-day -day operations or your disposal plans at the end of lifetime, let's bring that. There's plenty of folks, and many of them are here today, that have the capability to operate radars and telescopes. And so they're getting lots of data every single day on what's out there. There's software that exists and more that could be developed to determine orbits and predict trajectories and to analyze 
potential conjunctions. There's software that would be needed and can be used to maintain a catalog or a data lake, as it's sometimes called. There's a lot of talk about mega constellations, and that would be really interesting to know. How many satellites are we talking about? How big are they? What's their lifetime? What orbits are they going to be in? Is there anything else on those orbits? For the space lawyers and the policy analysts in the group, what are your thoughts on what those standards and guidelines and best practices and rules of the road should look like? And for the techno geeks, you're probably in a good position to know what do we need to work on? Where do we need additional research? What are some things that, that we can invest in that would allow us to improve our tracking or our processing or analysis? So if we can get the community together and every bring, everybody bring something to the table, I think we might be surprised at what the result could be. Now, if we're going to operate this way, I think it's really important to have some top-level guidelines that we all agree on, and I would propose these as, as potential principles. First of all, collaboration is certainly my belief that you can't talk about a successful, comprehensive space traffic management system if you're talking about one country or one department or one company. Even if a country, a department, or a company could do the whole thing, I'm not sure that's the best answer. I'd much rather see a collaborative effort where we're checking each other, we're challenging each other, we're bringing different skills and abilities to the table. And we need different kinds of people, too. We need engineers and scientists and lawyers and analysts and flight controllers and operators, all to help us solve this very challenging problem. Transparency is another principle, I think, that is very important. I, I certainly understand that some things need to be protected based on their classification, their sensitivity. But we're talking about safety here, and I think it's very important that we share the information we have on what is up there so that we don't run into it. And it's more than just the observations. We also need to understand their accuracy, the assumptions that were made in the processing and in the observations, because that way, and only that way, will we really understand what that data means, and how we should interpret and how credible the collision warning avoidance maneuvers are and the messages that we get that say, get out of the way. Those are gray decisions, and we need to know how did that recommendation get arrived at. I also think it's important to have an open architecture, basically almost a plug-and-play system, if you will, so that you can plug in new observations, should they become available, and you can change in and out software modules. If you've got somebody who says, hey, I've got a better algorithm to crunch these numbers. Great, let's try it. Bring. Let's have a fly-off. What works? What doesn't? And then continuous improvement. We should not view this as a situation under which you have an RFP goes out and a contract is awarded to one company and they implement the space traffic management system of 2019. And that's what we use for the next 20 years. That's not the right answer. This needs to evolve every day as we get smarter, as we get advanced technologies, as we learn things. And we ought to make it that way from the very start. So you might think that it would be very difficult to do this type of a bottoms-up activity and still, I'll say, compete with the existing process where the Department of Defense is providing these services. But in the studying that I've done and based on the people that I have talked to, that is not really the case. A system like we're talking about here, I believe, would absolutely be able to be more accurate, more timely, more complete in terms of the data than what is made publicly available 
by the U.S. government today. Now, they may have a lot more information behind the curtain, and that's fine, but that's not helping us for safety. And with a system like this, you could even talk about things like customer service. Imagine that. You have questions? You want to know what this data means? You want advice? Or is it just, here's the message, do with it what you want? And I think if we had roles and responsibilities and a coalition of the willing, if you will, and some priorities that have been established, we could make a lot more progress and a lot speedier progress in coming up with these guidelines, standards, best practices, and rules of the road. So what happens next? Well, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, the AIAA, under the leadership of Sandy Magnus, who's here with us today, former astronaut and executive director emeritus of AIAA, has stood up an STM working group. We've got three different teams. Team one, under the leadership of Diane Howard, which is going to focus on identifying the functional components of STM and trying to come up with a lexicon and tutorials. Team two, which is co-led by Marie Baja and myself, we're going to try to identify one or more test cases and then come up with a demonstration system that could be used to do a show and tell to decision makers, government leaders, and other stakeholders who don't know what space traffic management is all about. And then to potentially identify some needed improvement areas. Team three, under the leadership of, of Laurie Newman from NASA Goddard, has volunteered to focus on things like best practices and references and training materials. Let's scoop up all that's already been done and make it available to those who can benefit from it. And we had our kickoff telecon for this working group back on February the 4th, and we actually had 33 people on the phone. So that was very encouraging to see that level of interest. Our first face-to-face -face meeting is tomorrow, right here. And so even if you haven't heard about this before, if you're interested, you want to watch, you want to play, you got some ideas, some opinions, come on down. We would love to have you as part of that effort. It's unstructured, it's informal. We're going to roll up our sleeves and see if the working level experts in the technical areas and the legal areas and the policy areas, areas and the flight control areas can make some progress while the folks up above are arguing about the top level policies and the budgets and things like that. Our hope is that if we can make some progress at this level, then once all that gets sorted up, and we can support the direction we're heading in and get off to a much faster start towards safety and sustainability. So the hope is we'll have a productive interaction tomorrow, work for the next few months, and then if things go well, we'd like to roll out publicly our preliminary results at the International Astronomical Congress in Washington, D.C. this October. So. That'll be really interesting. I think it'll be a great opportunity for us to talk on the international stage about the state of the art, where we are, and, and what we could do if we work together. So bottom line, instituting a comprehensive system that's international for space situational awareness and space traffic management is imperative for ensuring space safety and sustainability. I would say that an incremental, bottoms-up approach has a lot of potential, and if we were to start such an effort, we could start seeing some immediate benefits. Recognizing that a lot of talk has, has happened over the years, there may still be some things we have to discuss. I think the time for action is now. Let's go do something. So thanks for your attention. Encourage your participation in the working group activity going forward. This is an important area, and we all have a role to play. Thank you.